thanks. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, I'm not supposed to have these uh, microphones that uh, made the previous speakers so impressive. Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, underneath. Underneath. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, the title is uh, Color Coding, Balance Hashing, and Proximate Counting. And uh, most of this is a uh, joint work with uh, uh, Shai Butner, but uh, I thought that you uh, deserve uh, more, so I, I added to the title and more, and the more part, this will be just at the uh, very end. Uh, uh, this will be a part from a, a recent joint work with uh, Daniel Lokstanov and uh, Saket Saura. Uh, so let me start with the uh, color coding, and uh, uh, and here is a question. Uh, uh, so so this question question was raised uh, some time ago by uh, uh, Christos Papadimitriou and Mihaly Siamakakis, uh, uh, and uh, they asked the following: Is it possible to decide in polynomial time if a given graph with n vertices, let's say undirected? contains a path of length exactly log base 2 of n, let's say, an integer path. Uh, now, this looks uh, somewhat uh, specific, uh, uh, but, uh, but you know that the old Greeks uh, always uh, know to ask the right questions. Uh, uh, they were actually not so old at that time, and, uh, <laughs> and they are also not so Greeks uh, now. <laughs> but, uh, but still, it's, uh, it turns out that this was uh, indeed the uh, uh, somehow a good question because, uh, uh, because indeed it leads to, uh, to many related things. Uh, and uh, I'll try to uh, tell you about this. Uh, of course, these are, uh, this is all old, so maybe many of you have seen it. Uh, uh, so uh, we uh, noticed with uh, Rafi Uster and Uri Zwick that uh, this answer is yes, that indeed this uh, can be done. And in fact, it's very simple, so I can really describe it in a few lines, and uh, this is what I uh, try to do here. Uh, so we we'll first uh, describe a randomized uh, algorithm, and afterwards we will uh, de-randomize it, uh, uh, convert it into a deterministic algorithm. And indeed, I think about this as a good example that uh, uh, illustrates the fact that often probabilistic reasoning is helpful. So it's, uh, even if you care only about uh, deterministic uh, algorithms, sometimes it's better to first think of a randomized algorithm and then to convert it uh, into a deterministic one. So let's describe a simple randomized algorithm. What we do is that we color the vertices randomly by uh, k colors. Uh, and uh, uh, after they are colored by k colors, so k is the number of vertices in the path I'm looking for. Uh, let's call a path a multicolored, let's see if this, uh, uh, right, so a path is a multicolored uh, if all its uh, uh, vertices uh, get distinct colors. Uh, and now we want to find efficiently if there is a multicolored k path for this given coloring using dynamic programming. And that's simple, I say a few words about this, but, uh, but it's simple to, uh, to see that indeed this can be done quickly. And, uh, uh, and basically that's it, right? So that will be the algorithm. If we, maybe we'll repeat it several times, uh, if we find a multicolored k-path, then definitely there is a k-path. If we did it several times, we'll soon see how many times, and we didn't find a k-path, then we'll say that probably there is the K path and uh, with high probability will be correct. So here is the relevant computation. The probability is that the path of K vertices will become multicolored is exactly K factorial over K to the K, which is roughly E to the minus K. So it's exponentially small in K. And therefore, if we do it about E to the K times, we will expect that if there is a path there, then it will become multicolored. Uh, now, a few words about the dynamic programming. Uh, so I just uh, wrote here what we have to do uh, to do it. Uh, basically, it's a simple exercise. So for every vertex V and every subset T of the set of the colors, we just check if there is a multicolored path 
of size t, the cardinality of t, many vertices, ending at the vertex v uh, using exactly the colors in t. Okay? And uh, so this is easy to start, and it's easy to uh, update it, because if we have things for sets of size i minus 1, then we can easily generate the required things for sets of size i. So maybe you see it immediately. If not, you have to uh, uh, think two minutes, but, uh, but this is uh, really simple. So that's the whole uh, randomized algorithm. Let me mention that uh, uh, so this basically gives the expected running time 2e to the k, roughly, because we have to repeat it e to the k times because of the probability. And the running time is roughly 2 to the k for each uh, specific. Uh, I mean, maybe I have to uh, multiply it here uh, by the size of the graph. But, uh, OK, so that's a dependence on k. And there is also a linear dependence on the size of the, of the graph. Uh, and actually, uh, there is a, a recent result by Yanis Kutis and uh, Ryan Williams uh, that shows how to improve this, uh, again, in a randomized algorithm to roughly 2 to the k. And the trick is that we color, instead of coloring by usual colors, we color by elements of uh, the right group algebra. So uh, we take the group z2 to the k with the coefficients in the field of characteristic 2, large field of characteristic 2. And somehow, if we color by elements of this field, we have to say something. But, uh, but then this will give us an improved expected running time. But as I said, we want really a deterministic algorithm. That was uh, also this uh, question of uh, of Akademitri Onyankakis, and, uh, and indeed this can be de-randomized uh, uh, easily, in fact, because you just have to uh, kind of uh, use uh, uh, what's known about perfect hashing. Uh, so, so the idea is to use or to observe that the explicit schemes of perfect hashings give us explicit families of size 2 to the OK, let's say, uh, times log n, I mean, the best construction roughly e to the k times log n, uh, colorings of a set of size n, this will be v, by k, k colors, so that every set of size k will be multicolored, namely will get a, a distinct colors in at least one of the colorings. Okay, and the, the specific uh, uh, references uh, start with uh, this, uh, uh, with this hashing scheme by uh, Mike Friedman, Janusz Komlos, and uh, Andrew Semeredi, and, uh, and then there is a somewhat uh, a more explicit way by uh, Jeanette Schmidt and Ellen Siegel, and, uh, and a better uh, uh, dependence on the param parameters by uh, Moni Noor, Leonard Schulman, and Darwin Srinivasan. And, uh, and basically, the last word is uh, that the size or the number of, the, uh, the number of uh, colorings in the family is roughly e to the k times log n. Uh, and uh, okay, so so it's written here that uh, this extends for finding copies of any graph with bounded tree width. Uh, so instead of path, we can try to find cycles or uh, some specific trees or uh, some serious parallel graphs. Uh, so some other things as well. It's basically uh, the same thing. Uh, and uh, and as I said at the beginning, I think this is a nice example where uh, indeed you see that. Uh, even if you care about a deterministic algorithm, it helps to think randomly, because if you look at the code when this is uh, implemented, uh, then most of the code will just do all kinds of operations in uh, finite fields, maybe, that uh, have to do with uh, generating these explicit families of uh, hash functions. And only at the very end, the algorithm will actually start looking at the graph, will do very simple things about the graph, just the dynamic programming that uh, uh, that I described, and then we'll answer if there is a path or a, there is no path. Uh, uh, and somehow, probably, we would not think about, uh, about an algorithm like that if we don't start by thinking randomly. OK, so, so this is about uh, deciding if there is a path of length k or not. Uh, uh, now it turns out that this is uh, uh, useful, in, uh, in, at least in the literature, uh, about computational uh, biology. Uh, and in fact, uh, this uh, increased the number of spam I get quite significantly, because I get all the announcements on the, the conferences and publications about uh, C elegance. Oh. So 
C elegance is what you see here that's a worm, uh, which is the first uh, uh, multicellular uh, uh, organism whose uh, genome uh, has been completely sequenced, and uh, it is smaller than what you see here. It is one uh, millimeter long, and, uh, and apparently when uh, looking at uh, uh, protein interaction networks of, uh, of this thing and uh, some uh, other organisms, uh, then it's common to look for uh, appearances of what is called motifs, uh, which are basically appearances of some specific subgraphs uh, of some relatively small size in a given graph which uh, represents uh, some network of this kind. And, uh, and maybe we want to know if, uh, uh, if some such network contains a path or a cycle of a given length or uh, some trees, uh, for example, because we want to know uh, how similar two such networks are to each other. Okay, uh, now this application actually suggests that uh, maybe more than deciding if these subgraphs say uh, exist there or not, we would actually want to count them also. And, uh, and I prefer to speak about path. Everything that I say here indeed extends to other graphs of bounded tree width, but, uh, uh, but it's good enough to think about a uh, path only. Uh, so suppose that uh, now I have a graph, again, on n vertices, and I want to count, and let's say that now I want to count precisely how many paths it has on k vertices. Okay? This would also be useful. And you see the dynamic programming, because it's so simple and so general, uh, it's, uh, it can easily be used also to count multicolored paths if we really color vertices uh, randomly or not randomly by some k colors, then we can decide quickly in essentially linear time, not only uh, can we decide if there is one path of length k, but we can actually count the number of paths of length k because uh, instead of what I said before is that uh, we maintain for each vertex and for each set of vertices, if there is a path using the colors in this set of colors, a path of the corresponding length that ends in, the, in that vertex, we just uh, maintain the number of such paths that end at that vertex, and again, it's easy to update it. Uh, but then, of course, if we know to do it for one coloring, and if we want to color, pre to count precisely how many paths of length k we have, uh, then what we have to do is uh, to find a family of colorings that will be completely balanced in the sense that every set of size k, which is a potential path, will be multicolored exactly the same number of times. And this number of times has to be positive. And if this will be the case, then if we will do the double counting, it will give us the exact number of, uh, uh, of paths that exist in our graph. Okay, so this uh, uh, suggests to a uh, to define what's called balanced families of hash functions, and, uh, and here is the definition. So we call a family of functions from n to k, and we think about it just as colorings of the set of n vertices of a graph by k colors. We'll call it a perfectly balanced family of hash functions if there is some positive number, t, so that every subset k of this set of vertices, say, uh, which is of size little k, the number of functions f that map k in a one-to-one -one fa uh, fashion is exactly t. Namely, this every set of k vertices will be colored in a one-to-one -one fashion, will use all the colors in exactly the same number of times. Right? And again, as I said, uh, this is exactly what, uh, so this is this balanced family of hash functions, and this is exactly what we need in order to count path precisely, because then if I have such a family and for each such coloring I'll count how many multicolored path I have with respect to this coloring, then I'll count every path exactly t times. So I'll sum it all and I'll divide by t and this will give me the number of paths. Okay, so the hope is that there are such families uh, and uh, hopefully also explicit and maybe they don't contain too many functions, but, uh, but this is not the case, uh, uh, because in fact such families must be large. Well, how large, uh, we don't know uh, precisely, but at least we can show that uh, 
they have to be of size at least n to the k over 2, or the integer part of uh, k over 2. And, uh, uh, and there are some simple constructions where they are of size n to the k minus 1. And, uh, and I want to show a, a proof of this, uh, uh, trying to uh, uh, challenge the fact that we cannot show any proof that takes more than uh, two lines in a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, so maybe this will be 10 lines or so, uh, but it's simple proof and it's uh, somehow a nice uh, linear algebra uh, uh, proof. Uh, so let me try to describe it. Uh, so suppose we have such a family uh, every set of size uh, k is uh, colored, uh, or the image of it uh, is of size k also in exactly t times, and we want to show that the family is big. So uh, what is usually done when we try to use this uh, linear algebra approach is that we define some vectors, and uh, we show that they are linearly independent, and, uh, uh, and this will give us uh, uh, some bound because uh, the uh, dimension of the space generated by these vectors cannot be more than their length. So here is how we do it here. Uh, uh, so we define for each set of size k over 2, each k over 2 vertices or things that get uh, a color, we define two vectors uh, that are denoted here by this uh, uh, u sub r and, uh, and w r, so these are the two vectors. Uh, and uh, they will be of length some constant depending on k, which uh, here will be k choose k over 2, so about 2 to the k, times the cardinality of a. So there are, the length is up to a constant depending on k, uh, the cardinality of a. And the uh, coordinates of each such vector are indexed by the ordered pairs f and s, where f is a function in our family, and s is a subset of the set of colors of size k over 2. Okay? And here is the definition. So for the first vector, ur in coordinate fs will be 1 if and only if the function f maps r into s. Okay? So necessarily it is in a one-to-one -one manner because they are both of the same size, say k over 2. So let's assume for now that k is even. Now for w, we do something similar. The vector wr maps in coordinate fs is 1 if and only if f maps r to the complement of s, to k minus s. Okay. Uh, and here comes the problem because we have to uh, move to another page, but uh, okay. And then the thing to observe is that the inner product of two such vectors, ur and wq, will be 0 if the two sets R and Q intersect and will be exactly T if they are disjoint. So let's go back here, not so much. Uh, let's go back here and look again at the vectors. So what is the inner product between two such vectors? Well, it counts the number of pairs Fs in which we see one in both vectors because this is what uh, will contribute to the inner product. Now, if uh, S, uh, so if we have here a, the u corresponding to r and the w corresponding to q, and r and q are not disjoint, then certainly they cannot map r to two disjoint things. And therefore, this will never happen if they are not disjoint. But if they are disjoint and f maps their union in a one-to-one -one way, then exactly there will be one place in which we we'll see one in both places. So I see. Uh, so, so this is simple. And because of this, it means that the uh, product of the matrix whose rows are the vectors ur with the matrix whose columns are the vectors wq is exactly what's called the disjointness matrix. Namely, it will be a matrix whose rows and columns are indexed by uh, sets of size uh, uh, k over 2 in n. And uh, uh, it will be 0 if the sets are not disjoint. If they are disjoint, it will give us exactly t. So it is a disjointness matrix uh, times t. Uh, it is known and simple that this matrix has full rank over the reals. And because of this, also uh, both matrices uh, in the product uh, have at least the same rank. And because of this, the number of columns, let's say, in the first matrix uh, 
is at least the rank of this product, and uh, this is what's written here, which gives us the uh, lower bound for it. So f is at least n to the k over two. As I said, uh, uh, you can uh, uh, you can show that n to the k minus one times some constant is in uh, uh, is an upper bound. Uh, in fact, if we really care, uh, we can uh, uh, show that for k equals two, the precise minimum is n, if and only if uh, there is no Hadamard matrix. Uh, of size n by n, and if there is such a matrix, then the precise minimum is n minus one. Of course, this does not really matter for the uh, asymptotic result, but what this means is that we will not be able to use this thing in order to count path in a given uh, input graph uh, quickly. So we will need at least time n to the k over two. Actually, it is known that one can count precisely the number of paths in a graph of size n, in time about n to the k over two. That's a, a recent paper by uh, Williams and uh, Vasilevska. Uh, but uh, the fact that we cannot count precisely path more efficiently is actually not surprising. And, uh, uh, and this leads us to uh, what's known about uh, what's called the parameterized complexity. So let me tell you a little bit about this. Uh, so this was introduced in the 90s by uh, Downing Fellows, and, uh, and there are at least two books about it and, uh, and many papers. And, uh, and this came from the ob observation that for many anti-hard problems, uh, they come with a natural parameter. And often it is the case that if this parameter is small, then the algorithmic problem can be actually solved quickly. So maybe the problem is NP-hard, so if the parameter is big, then we don't know and probably there is no uh, polynomial time algorithm, but if the parameter is small, then there is an efficient algorithm. And uh, uh, specifically, the definition is that uh, uh, if we have, so a problem will be called fixed parameter tractable if on input of size n in parameter k, there is an algorithm that runs in time some function of k times fixed polynomial in A. Okay. So for example, what we saw in the beginning is that deciding if a graph of size n contains a path of length k is fixed parameter tractable when the parameter is k. Okay. But on the other hand, uh, uh, at least according to what we uh, know so far, deciding if a graph contains a clique of size k is fixed parameter uh, intractable in the sense that it is complete for one of these say, corresponding complexity classes, namely if we can do this in time that is uh, some function of the parameter times some fixed polynomial, then we can do many other things in a similar way, including many things that we don't know to do. Uh, now it turns out, and this is uh, somewhat surprising, so that's a result by uh, Flume and Broe, that the problem of counting the number of paths of length k in a graph of size n is complete for one of these, uh, is what's called sharp W1 complete. Namely, if there is an algorithm that will count precisely the number of paths of size k in an input graph of size n in time f of k times uh, n to a fixed power, then there will also be an algorithm that counts the number of clicks of size k in such a graph in a similar running time. And there will be similar algorithms for uh, several other problems. Uh, so therefore, it is not surprising that there are no small families of perfectly balanced hash functions uh, because uh, this would uh, uh, give some collapse uh, for these complexity classes. Okay, but uh, we still uh, uh, have this, uh, this, that's another uh, picture of this uh, C elegance. So, so we still have to know something about these uh, protein interaction networks. And obviously, uh, if we want to know if they are similar, there is no real reason to count precisely the number of subgraphs of a, of a certain type in them. It will be enough to count it approximately. So to know it, uh, and this is what we uh, want to consider next. Uh, uh, so suppose that I only want to approximate, and again, let's talk about path. I want to approximate the number of path of length k up to a relative error of 1%, let's say. And I want to do it 
randomly, maybe better deterministically, can I do that? Uh, so we already saw that probably we cannot count precisely, but maybe we can count uh, approximately. And, uh, and for that, uh, uh, again, if we want to still use the same approach of this color coding and using <coughs> dynamic programming to, uh, to count multicolored paths, then uh, oh, maybe I, I first wrote here that to do it randomly is kind of uh, very simple. So uh, uh, in particular, uh, we do it in this paper with Dao Hajihaksu Liha, Homo Zidiari, and uh, Sainal. I was thinking to say that uh, the algorithm is much, much simpler than uh, <laughs> the problem of pronouncing the actual names of the co authors. But, uh, um, so, really, the paper is, uh, is more on the applications to uh, these questions in computational biology. But uh, basically, if we just uh, uh, color randomly and count, then using any standard uh, a large deviation inequality, it will follow that every set of size k will be colored with distinct colors in about the correct number of times. And therefore, we will get, by the double counting, the approximate number of paths or uh, subgraphs of bounded tree widths, uh, whatever we are trying to count. So the interesting thing uh, here will be to do it deterministically. In order to do it deterministically, uh, it's also obvious, again, from the general approach, that what you need is uh, what we call here an epsilon balanced family of hash functions, uh, uh, which is uh, defined in, the, in this paper uh, with Shai. And, uh, and I think uh, uh, we think it can be useful for uh, uh, several other applications as well. Uh, uh, because hash uh, functions are so useful and, uh, and that's kind of a natural extension. So when is a family of functions, or think about it, about colorings of n vertices by k colors, uh, when is it called an epsilon balanced family of hash functions? So here is the definition. We want that there will be some number t, which has to be positive, so that for every subset k of this set of vertices, which is of size k, the number of functions f in the family that map k to distinct colors, so in a one-to-one uh, -one manner, just gives them all the different k colors, is roughly t. So before we wanted them to be exactly t, now we want it to be at least mi one minus epsilon t and at most one plus epsilon t. And we just think about epsilon as some uh, small fixed uh, positive ring. Uh, so this is the definition. Uh, now the fact that uh, follows easily from the probabilistic method is that there are such families which are small. Namely, if we just take uh, a size of family that is slightly more than the minimum size of family that is needed for just getting a, per a family of perfect hash functions, namely a family in which every set of size k is mapped by at least one coloring to different colors, so it is known that for this tight lower and upper bounds are this uh, uh, roughly e to the k times log n. Then if we add this uh, little o1 here, uh, <coughs> then, uh, well, it's in the exponent, so, so we multiply it by quite a lot. But, but then a, a random family of functions will be, a, will be good with high probability. Every set will be mapped uh, uh, in a one-to-one -one, uh, manner. In, roughly the same uh, number of times, and, uh, and that's basically uh, this simple computation uh, that I told you before that exists using uh, Hofding or something. Uh, but of course, we want it in order to de-randomize uh, this randomized algorithm. So the only point is to uh, construct such a family explicitly. And, uh, uh, and this is what we want to do, and it turns out that this can be done and uh, so here is a statement. Uh, the statement is that there exists an explicit construction of an epsilon balanced family of functions. And what is written here is for every epsilon that is, uh, let's say, one over polynomial in K. Okay. Uh, so this will be functions from N to K. K is the number of colors. Uh, the number of functions will be uh, as small as it can be, again, up to this little one K. So of course, uh, little o 1k is bigger than what it should be in the minimum, but, uh, uh, but it's essentially e to the k times log n. And it can be constructed in time which is uh, 
essentially linear, so almost linear up to a, uh, well, I guess, uh, up to all these three row one factors. So essentially linear in the number of in the time it takes to write down the functions. So I should say that it's not as explicit as some explicit constructions are. Sometimes we want that explicit constructions will be in log space or in a, but here we, for the application, we don't really care, right? We anyway have to use these colorings afterwards and for each coloring, we are going to do something about the graph and to count up. So it's enough that we can really construct this in time that it takes to, to write them down. And that's essentially what is uh, known for usual uh, uh, constructions of uh, families of hash functions if we insist on, uh, on the best uh, dependence of the parameters. Uh, now the construction is a bit technical, so it uses two uh, relatively standard uh, steps, and this is a, these are the first and the last. Uh, so I wrote here small sample spaces supporting nearly pairwise independent random variables. Uh, this is basically to start with some version of, a, of hashing, and the last uh, step is a method of conditional expectations, which is also quite standard. The middle step is, uh, is technically quite involved, and uh, that's some recursive construction based on some uh, properties of expanders. And uh, I, uh, uh, so I could try, but I decided that uh, I don't want to, uh, to describe the, the details here, uh, but, uh, but this uh, takes uh, some efforts. Uh, let me also mention that, uh, so this will be this family of functions, and uh, in every set of size k, uh, <coughs> let's say k vertices, if you think about these functions as coloring of the vertices, every set of size k will be colored by the k distinct colors in about the same number of times, so between one minus epsilon t and one plus epsilon t. And uh, it's interesting to note that uh, this t will not be the right number of times. So it will not be the same number of times that you will get if you will take really random functions. Maybe it will be actually smaller. So uh, we will not have as many functions that make them, uh, the probability is that a random function in this family makes this set of size k in a one-to-one -one fashion will not be k factorial over k to the k, but will be somewhat smaller. And this is somehow a, a something that uh, follows because of the properties of, uh, of this construction. And, uh, uh, which means that it's not exactly a de-randomization of the randomized construction, but, uh, but you have to work. Okay, so I said that uh, I don't want to uh, talk about the uh, technical details of this, but let me just mention that, uh, that what it implies is that, uh, uh, that we can approximate the number of k path or any other given graph of size k and bounded tree width uh, in a given input graph up to a relative error of one over polynomial in k, let's say 1% if you want, uh, in time which is exponential in, uh, in this k and nearly linear in the size of the input graph. Uh, fine, so, uh, so I still have uh, almost 15, almost 15 minutes to the end more. So, uh, so let me talk about the more. So it's very related, and that's why I thought that uh, it's useful to tell you about it. And, uh, uh, and it's also, it's some other variant of, uh, of color coding, uh, which seems to be, again, uh, useful for some of these uh, algorithmic problems. And I'll just tell you what it is, and I'll show only one application. Uh, uh, and as I'll mention, uh, there are a few more. Uh, so, uh, so this is uh, uh, in a joint paper with Lukshtanov and Saurab. And uh, the corresponding definition here, so this is this thing that we want to construct, and I'll only tell you that we can construct, but uh, uh, so it's something that is slightly more complicated than, uh, than families of, uh, of perfect hash functions. Uh, and this will be a family of functions from a set of size M, and again, it's good to think about it as a set of vertices of graph to R. So let's say that now the uh, number of colors is this uh, R. And let's call it a universal MKR coloring family if it has the following property. Whenever we have a graph G on the set of vertices M, 
and the graph does not have too many edges, so it has at most k edges, then at least one of our colorings colors this uh, graph properly. So it's a proper vertex coloring of the graph. And, uh, and I wrote it here that in particular such a family has to be a perfect hash family for sets of size square root k because maybe the graph is a clique of size square root k that has less than k edges. So this clique, the vertices have to be met uh, into distinct colors, but, uh, but it should be good for other graphs as well, right? So even for a matching of size k, uh, whenever you take uh, k pairs of, uh, uh, of vertices in this graph, then one of your colors would have to, okay, so it will have to take care of all the graphs of size k. Uh, so this is a universal MKR coloring family, and uh, uh, in the statement, and again, uh, uh, I won't show the construction, but that there is an explicit family of roughly two to the square root k, so there is some logarithmic factor in the uh, exponent here, logarithmic in k, times log n functions from n, from <coughs> a set of size n, uh, let's say the vertices of a graph of size n, to k colors, and this will be uh, universal, so again, up to this log, nk square root k, universal coloring family, namely this is a family of colorings of the vertices of a graph on n vertices by about square root k colors, and every graph with at most k edges is colored properly by at least one of these coloring. Uh, and as we said, uh, uh, this is, so in particular, this has to be a perfect hash family for sets of size square root k, and therefore by the known lower bound for hashing, the number of functions have to be about uh, e to the square root k times log n, so up to this, uh, just a second, up to this log factor, this will be tight. Question? Or? What if you make them just uh, uh, good perfect hash functions on all the vertices in this? Graph? Yeah, but, uh, but then so they will be, uh, you mean for, for sets of size k? So then we well, will have here, uh, we will have here 2 to the k, right? The number of vertices is not serious, right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's always, uh, right. So, so the important thing here is the behavior on the k, that is square root. The number of vertices, we think about it as much, much bigger, and usually in all these questions, you can, you can easily somehow, as a first step, reduce the number of vertices to k square or something. Yeah, so really, the, yeah. So the main thing is that uh, the dependence on k. And, uh, and I'll show you one uh, application of this, uh, which is simple to explain. And this is a, a feedback arc set problem for tournaments. Okay, so this is, uh, uh, so what is this? Uh, so here is a tournament. A tournament is an oriented complete graph. You will see here an oriented complete graph and uh, uh, which here is quite simple. And the feedback arc set is a set of arcs whose reversal makes it acyclic, okay, or whose reversal or whose omission, it's the same, but uh, so here, for example, we can take this uh, and reverse it. Uh, I, we were talking before if, uh, if using PowerPoint is uh, better than using Beamer, and, uh, and I mentioned that, uh, that PowerPoint is much better for animation, but then I said that uh, normally I never have time and I hardly use animation, but uh, but you see that here I use this uh, <laughs> complicated animation, so try to do it in Beamer. Yeah, yeah. But it's, uh, okay, but, uh, but still, it's, uh, in principle, it is better. <laughs> okay, so this, is a, uh, so this is a feedback arc set, uh, so I think that's clear. A tournament is an oriented complete graph, and a feedback arc set, we want uh, a set of arcs whose reversal makes it acyclic, and usually we want to find the minimum feedback arc set. Right, because a tournament, so you have this, uh, I don't know, basketball team, say uh, every pair uh, had a match with each other, and then you're trying to decide an order which will tell you which is best and which is worst, and, uh, and the reasonable criterion is to decide that we want to order them in such a way that the number of arcs that go backwards will be minimized. Okay, uh, so... So as is the case, uh, okay, and it's written that the feedback arc set for tournaments is given T and K, 
does he have a feedback arc set of size at most k? Because again, maybe I want to look at the case where k is relatively small. Uh, but first, uh, so it is known that uh, this problem is uh, NP-hard. This was actually open, so it was a conjecture of uh, Bangiensen, uh, Jürgen Bangiensen, and uh, Karsten uh, Thomasen for a while. Uh, and then uh, a Elon Charikar and Newman uh, uh, found a way to show that it's NP-hard under randomized uh, reductions, and, uh, and I realized how this can be de-randomized, uh, this proof. So, uh, so indeed, this problem is NP-hard, even for tournaments. So given a tournament, deciding how many, what is the minimum number of arcs you have to reverse uh, in order to make it acyclic is NP-hard. Uh, so we could try to approximate it, and there are some uh, uh, nice papers about that, and uh, we can try to look about the parameterized version, namely to solve it when k is relatively small. And people looked at that as well, and uh, in fact, uh, here is uh, one paper that uh, does it in time which is <coughs> polynomial. So again, it is fixed parameter tractable. If the parameter is a number of arcs, we have to reverse, uh, and it can be solved in time which is a uh, a power of n plus a uh, exponential in a, in k. And, uh, <coughs> yeah, when the lectures are not, uh, so I, I keep computing time all the time, uh, but uh, at least uh, unlike Romit, I'm not asking after 10 minutes if I'm already <laughs> have to finish, so it's, uh, <laughs> it's uh, okay. Um, and here is a, the new result is that uh, in fact it can be solved in time, so again, n to some fixed power, plus 2 to the square root k. So you can still solve it in polynomial time, even if k is a log square n, let's say. And, uh, uh, and it's actually simple to explain. So, uh, okay. uh, so it's simple to explain. So let me try to say something about it. Uh, uh, so suppose that uh, we have this tournament and we manage to color the vertices so that the graph of all arcs in an optimal feedback arc set is properly t-colored. Well, suppose it is properly two-colored, because uh, uh, so in this picture, maybe I tried some two-coloring of the tournament, and maybe uh, I'm lucky in the graph consisting of the, uh, all the edges of the optimal feedback arc set is properly two-colored. Okay? Namely, all these uh, edges are edges that go from here to here. Well, of course, yeah. Here is where I really had to use animation, but I didn't. Anyway, so it's, a, but it's a, okay. Um, so, so the thing is that, uh, you see, if, if this is indeed a, a good two-coloring, uh, which, by the way, uh, which is blue in my uh, screen, but anyway. Uh, so uh, if this is a good two-coloring, then in the tournament on each of these pieces here, in the sub-tournament, this has to be acyclic. So I know really the order in the order I'm looking for, I know the order of the vertices in this part, and I know the order of the vertices in that part. And then it's easy to see that by dynamic programming, I can decide what is now the best order, because if I already put these two vertices here and these three vertices here in an optimal way, now the next vertex that has to come must be either this next vertex here or that vertex here. And of course, I'm going to use the best order that I had so far on the vertices that are arranged so far. So I can, by dynamic programming, find the best way now to merge like these two orders and find the minimum number of arcs that will be oriented backward. So we can do it uh, in time n to the t, if t is the number of uh, colors. And now it turns out, and uh, that's uh, not difficult to show, uh, although it's kind of a nice exercise, that. Uh, a random coloring of a graph with k edges by square root k <coughs> colors is a proper coloring with probability at least 2 to the minus square root k. There are some constants here, but uh, okay. And because of this, if we will use randomization, if we color randomly, we do it 2 to the square root k times, now there are no logarithmic factors, then at least once this optimal uh, feedback arc set will be colored properly, and then we'll find it by doing this dynamic programming. And there is some other trick which changes it from 2 to the square root k times some power of n to a 2 square root k plus some power of n. But uh, uh, let's, uh, let's ignore this. 
and just uh, mention that, um, uh, that de-randomizing it is exactly this universal coloring families because exactly what we want is a, a set of colorings so that every set of at most k edges, this is optimal feedback arc set, in at least one of the colorings, the graph that they define will be properly square root k colors, and this will give in the dynamic programming another uh, maybe uh, k to the square root k or something like this. Okay, and just uh, to finish, so there are several uh, specific uh, problems, but uh, but I'll not uh, mention them. It just uh, let me just say that these uh, universal coloring families they can be defined for hypergraphs as well in the obvious way, and, and the constructions can be extended as well, and uh, and this is useful for some problems like betweenness or whatever. So uh, so there are some problems that you can define, and uh, uh, and it will be interesting to understand better what you what can be done by this. Uh, and also maybe to further explore what can be done by uh, these balanced uh, families of, uh, of hash functions. And, uh, and with this, I'll finish, and uh, thank you for your attention.